Well, good evening, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us. My name is Norman Goda. I am the Norman and Irma Brayman Professor of Holocaust Studies and the director for the Center for Jewish Studies here at the University of Florida. Welcome to tonight's event, The Berlin Mission, a conversation with Richard Brightman. Let me introduce tonight's participants and then we will get underway. Uh, joining me in the questioning this evening is Dr. Rebecca Erbelding. Dr. Erbelding received her PhD in history from George Mason University, and since 2003, she has been a research historian, a curator, and an archivist at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. She is also the author of the prize-winning Rescue Board, the untold story of America's efforts to save the Jews of Europe. If you have not read Rescue Board, I strongly urge you to do so. It is a complete reevaluation of the War Refugee Board that was formed in 1944 and its importance. Our guest of honor tonight, Richard Brightman, has written numerous books on Nazi Germany and the Holocaust. Rather than name them all, and there are quite a few, I will say that they are truly landmarks in how we think of critical issues, from the planning and timing of the final solution to what allied intelligence agencies knew about the Holocaust, even as it was occurring, to the policies of the United States government toward the Jews of Europe and the catastrophe they faced under Hitler. But tonight is very special in a sense in that all of these themes are ensconced in his most recent book, which has just appeared with Public Affairs Press, The Berlin Mission, The American Who Resisted Nazi Germany from Within. Welcome, Rebecca, and welcome, Richard. Thank you. We are Thank going you. to get going. I want to tell everyone in the audience, and there are quite a few of you, again, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Um, if you have questions, uh, send them in via chat, and we will get to them uh, in the latter half of tonight's program. Uh, so, Richard, um, tell us first uh, what, what brought you uh, to write this book. It's, it's about a man named Raymond Geist. Uh, who, who was Raymond Geist, and what brought you to write about him? Well, very briefly, Geist was a consul and diplomat extraordinaire. Um, he had a very unusual background, and we'll probably talk about that later. Um, people used to ask me, who is Raymond Geist? And I'd say, well, um, he gave a visa to Einstein. He got Freud out of Vienna, and he predicted the Holocaust. That's That was my attempt to explain why I was writing this book um, before I wrote it. Once I'd finished it, uh, I realized I'd come to a slightly different uh, answer, which is Geist was the very best foreign observer of Nazi Germany at the time. And he was able to do something about uh, or with his knowledge, something constructive with his knowledge uh, uh, in the way of humanitarian action during the 1930s when he was in Berlin. And even after he came back to Washington and became a State Department official, uh, he had learned the lessons of Nazi Germany. And I, I opened the book with a quote from a speech that he gave in 1940, which was an election year in the United States. Much of what Hitler did in the German Reich, the processes of dictatorial government, which he invented and set in motion, are schemes which any group of politicians might seize upon here or anywhere else at any time. I've seen them worked out as to the utmost limit under Hitler, and I fear that we, meaning Americans, have those among us who would gladly sacrifice their liberties for the kind of precarious security which Hitler provided for his followers for all too brief a time. Prescient. Yes. And for 1940. I mean, one of the things that I think we'll get into a lot tonight is how different Geist was from so many other people in the State Department. 
and what a flaw it is when we paint the State Department with one brush and just say everyone was anti-Semitic, everyone wanted to keep Jews out. And so one of the ways I think in which Geist is, is the most different from some of the others is that he cultivated relationships with Nazi officials. He had relationships with Himmler. He, you talk about him meeting with Heydrich. He had a, a relationship with Werner Best that, that actually proved really fruitful. How did he do that? Um, why did he do that? Well, um, Geist started out as a consul. And one of the jobs of, of the consuls was to protect American interests, uh, broadly speaking. Uh, when the Nazis came to power, Geist found himself trying to rescue American citizens, mostly American Jews, who had been beaten up, brutalized, thrown in prison, or just held somewhere privately by uh, SA or SA, SS thugs. Uh, and so he came into contact with officials of the SS and police very early. And um, he had very good German. He was himself of German extraction. Uh, he knew how to talk to them. Uh, he had been an actor in one of his many early careers. Uh, he knew how to uh, uh, play a, a very assertive role or a very uh, gentlemanly role as the case called for. Uh, and so he was able to build up uh, personal ties with some of these people. And I think uh, he had an early breakthrough in 1934 when he got in to see Himmler and once he had met personally with Himmler. It was as if Himmler had said to his subordinates, okay, this is, this is a guy uh, you can talk to. This is a guy that you can deal with. So uh, he, he took that and ran with it. His, 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 con his contacts though um, are, are really extraordinary. Um, you know, when we think about it, uh, Himmler in, in 34, right when the SS's star is very ascendant um, in, in August after the Night of the Long Knives. Um, uh, Reinhard Heydrich, the, the chief of the security police, uh, Werner Best, uh, the number two man in the Gestapo, as well as various um, local police chiefs in, in, in Berlin, Vienna. Um, he, he, had a, he had a connection with Goering um, and, and so on. Um, and he he came to uh, he he came to make certain predictions and, and certain understandings about the Nazi state that were very uncommon at the time. Would you not say uh, that that he was almost an intelligence man at a time when there were no intelligence men um, in Nazi Germany? Well, he he was an intelligence man in the sense that um, one of the jobs of um, diplomats, more than consuls. Uh, was to assess the environment in which they were operating and to, uh, if they could, uh, suggest uh, courses of action back to Washington. Uh, and um, as you say, there were no uh, civilian uh, intelligence uh, officials at that time. There were, of course, military intelligence uh, people, but um, they usually saw their job fairly, as fairly narrow. And so um, it was the State Department, the consuls and the diplomats who provided both uh, raw intelligence and intelligence analysis. And Geist was the best of them. He, to the best of my knowledge, he was the most astute foreign observer of Nazi Germany at the time. Well, and part of it was, was the contacts. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, he has, I mean, he has such a close relationship with George Messersmith at the beginning. Um, for, for people who don't know, George Messersmith is kind of infamous for historians because he, if you're looking at 1933 and 1934, he will write a 20 page letter with you or to you, you know, detailing absolutely everything that's happening. But George Messersmith then goes to first to Austria and then to the State Department in Washington and Geist stays in Berlin. 
Um, and by the time Messersmith gets to Washington, he doesn't seem to understand anymore what's happening. And so I think that that is one of the values that Geist has is he actually has this relationship with, with Messersmith and is able to kind of convince him, I think, a little bit more. Well, I'm, I'm actually uh, very grateful to George Messersmith because uh, a very long time ago, I went to uh, Newark, Delaware, the now famous University of Delaware, um, to look at the, the Messersmith papers. And it was in going through Messersmith's very long letters um, that I came across Raymond Geist. And I was much more impressed with Geist's analysis than I was with Messerschmitt. Uh, and this was, I, I, I hate to admit how old I am to tell you uh, when this was, but um, a very long time ago, um, I said, gee, I'd like to do something about this guy Geist, but he'd never become an ambassador. Uh, he didn't have private papers, his own collection of private papers in any public archive. Um, uh, I, I wrote to various people named Geist in the Midwest, uh, hoping to make a connection and never got anywhere with that. This was before the age of social media. Um, and uh, I, all I could do was, was to start a Geist file. And that file grew very, very slowly over many years. And um, I had a breakthrough. Um, uh, a woman named Melissa Jane Taylor uh, told me that she had a copy of Geist's personnel file from, from the archives um, in St. Louis. And would I like a copy? And um, it was a very large and very interesting personnel file, unlike many. And that was the moment when I said, gee, I think I might be able to do a book on Geist now, but I didn't know the half of what I was going to discover in the course of that research. Well, um, two of the things uh, you've discovered really jump out at me. Um, well, a lot of it jumps out at me, but when, when we talk about Geist as someone with um, connections and someone with, um, you know, real analytical skills in describing the Nazi regime, um, there are two reports uh, in this book, one to Pierpont Moffat, um, the, the head of the State Department, uh, Western Europe Division, this is in June of 34, when he says, uh, I cannot sufficient, uh, sufficiently emphasize what would happen if the present regime were able to create a strong Germany. It would make war, which would, quote, change the course of history, if not civilization, um, beyond what we even dream. Uh, and then um, the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, report he writes to Ambassador Wilson um, in 1938, after meeting with um, Werner Best, the Germans are determined to solve the Jewish problem without the assistance of other countries, and that means eventual annihilation. Nobody was writing this stuff at this time, no? Not on the basis of inside information. Uh, there were people, of course, predicting disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, and there had been some since 1933, but this was not, um, you know, this is what the Nazis might conceivably do sometime in the distant future. This was somebody saying, uh, in effect, the number two men in the Gestapo just told me uh, that they are going to annihilate the Jews. And um, uh, what made it all the more extraordinary was that um, Geist, understood his audience. And on the same day, he wrote letters to Messersmith and to Wilson. Messersmith was a kind of Roosevelt Democrat. Um, and his instinct was to be very tough with Nazi Germany, maybe break off relations. Um, and Geist knew how to talk to Messersmith. Of course, they had spent years 
together in Berlin. Uh, Wilson was an isolationist who wanted to avoid war at all cost and wanted to try to cultivate some sort of um, cordial ties with Nazi Germany. And Geist basically uh, went in the other direction saying, uh, Roosevelt in, in publicly uh, criticizing Kristallnacht and uh, threatening uh, uh, what we would call sanctions um, uh, has gone too far and we don't want the Nazis to take out their, uh, their anger, uh, their resentment on the Jews. If we're going to, uh, this is part of what he said to Messerschmitt, if we're gonna criticize them, then let's go all the way and declare war on them and try to get rid of the regime. But uh, we don't want the Jews to be the ones uh, suffering from our public criticism. Well, and that's what's so interesting is I think with the with the ideas that we have today, we assume after Kristallnacht, they should have blown it up. They should have, we should have cut ties. We should have protested more loudly. We should have gone to war. And you kind of make a different argument in this book. And you say that Geist is really smartly um, thinking about this in the context of the time and, and thinking about what this means for immigration. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, as you know very well um, from your own work, uh, um, this uh, was a period in which the immigration quota from Germany was filled, uh, the period uh, from the second half of 1938 through, um, let's say, the very early part of World War II uh, is uh, a period in which nearly 100% of the quota for Germany um, was filled. And that was a very substantial quota, unlike the quota for Eastern European countries. So um, Geist had in mind the fact that he was able to save lives as long as the United States maintained relations with some kind of relations with Germany and neither side you know, broke it off uh, in anger. And uh, he knew that uh, most of those immigrants would make very good uh, American citizens and the, the country would be much stronger for it. Uh, and so he didn't want uh, a, an expression of moral outrage, which, which would be empty of mm -hmm. real humanitarian content. He apologizes at one point, doesn't he, uh, for, for this sort of rogues gallery that, uh, that he meets with, but he points to the, the practical uh, use of them. Yeah. He says to Messerschmitt, don't think that I like these people. <laughs> it's, it's that I have to maintain a relationship uh, with some of them in order to get people out of concentration camps and in order to get visas and to get people out of the country. And so um, uh, he's holding his nose figuratively and uh, bargaining with them. And uh, he figures that's the best way he could do his job. Yeah, so you push so far, but if we push too far, or the Nazis push too far back, then nobody's getting out. Then they're just gonna close the doors and um, take the passports and everyone is stuck. Absolutely. But in a sense, this was all done. I mean, would you, would you not say that this was, this was this, this uh, reasoning he has, it's, it's partly intrinsic, but it's partly after 1938, built on this real belief he has that whoever we don't get out, is facing physical annihilation. Absolutely, and you know, when, when he wrote to Messersmith, he tried to appeal to Messersmith uh, uh, because Geist was doing uh, some things to stretch the quota a little bit, and he knew that he might run into trouble uh, in Washington. So he'd say, well, there's um, Frau X, and Herr Y, whom you remember very well, and they're both in desperate straits uh, right now, and I'm going to do what I can uh, to help them. Uh, and uh, one of the techniques that he was using was to uh, talk to the British and French uh, 
consuls and diplomats and see if he could get some of the people who were on the waiting list or on the quota list uh, for American immigration visas, see if he could get them out of the country um, right away so that they could wait in London or in Paris or somewhere uh, until their turn came up for uh, visas to the United States. And he did that for a while and then uh, the bureaucrats in Washington cracked down on it. Right, because we couldn't be making a promise to England that these people would eventually get visas. Yeah, it was called mortgaging the quotas. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, he actually uh, did something else which was uh, in the short run, very useful, uh, and in the long run had a uh, one unknown uh, side effect. I, I have, I didn't even write about this in the book because I, I despaired of trying to explain it all in a short uh, section. Um, Geist was in charge of administering uh, the quota overall, and uh, uh, he could apportion uh, a different number of visas to different consulates. Well, once Germany annexed Austria, the situation of many uh, tens of thousands of Austrian Jews became dire right away. And so he transferred quota numbers uh, from some of the German uh, uh, consulates, but also from some foreign locations to Vienna so that more Austrian Jews mm -hmm. Uh, could get out. And one of the places that he took quota uh, pieces away from uh, was Havana, Cuba. And mm -hmm. you know where I'm going with this. Yes. Uh, the uh, number of refugees waiting for American visas in Havana um, got to be larger and larger. And the, the uh, American diplomats and consuls there were complaining about Geist's move and eventually um, Cuban officials decided to um, stop admitted, uh, admitting people with only tourist visas. And that was the reason why uh, they turned away the MS St. Louis. See, I'm kind of with Geist here though, because he wasn't gonna transfer a thousand visas to Havana. There are about 8,000 Jewish refugees in Vienna or in Havana. They would have needed 1,000 for the passengers on the St. Louis. Well, he and, also, I mean, the St. Louis came later, of course. Uh, yeah. This, this was in 1938 that he uh, took visas away from Havana. And he couldn't foresee what was going to uh, happen. But he certainly knew that however bad the situation was for Jews in Havana, uh, it was a lot worse in Vienna, and he was literally saving people's lives if he could get them out of uh, Vienna. Well, I mean, there's so much um, moving around of visa allocations at this time. Because originally, they would just give consulates pots of visas, and if they didn't make, through, make it through them, then those went to waste. And I'm assuming then it was Geist who made the decision that um, it would be run out of out of those areas and divvied up according to need and according to where people were. For a while and then eventually Washington uh, forced him to go yeah. to an alternative quota system. Yeah. So if we can back up just for a second, um, because I'm not sure everybody, you know, the, the quota system is a little, um, is, it can be a little bit daunting, um, but I, but I want to get to sort of the general question on that. Y you make the argument that Geist uh, pushes the absolute limit of what is possible within this quota system, you know, which allocates uh, 25, 26,000 um, uh, quota slots to Germany, uh, Germany proper, um, per year. Um, what? Okay, if we, if very quickly, what were the quotas? Uh, how firm were they expected to be? Because you point out in, in, uh, in the book that in fiscal year 1934, the visa rejection rate, the, the people who were rejected for visas, even if the quota slots were there, was 93%, a 93% rejection rate. So 
you know, here you, you, you describe somebody who is pushing the system and, and I, I wonder if we can fill that out a little bit. All right, uh, I'll, I'll try a mini lecture and Becky can interrupt or, or correct afterwards as she likes. Um, so um, uh, the basic quota system was set by law by Congress in the 1920s and it provided um, different um, ceilings for immigration for different countries based on um, their um, share of uh, the US population, their ancestor, uh, the ancestors uh, in the US population uh, uh, at an early, much earlier date. So um, there were a lot of uh, Germans who came to the United States in the 19th century. So Germany got a pretty sizable quota uh, and Eastern European countries uh, who sent or allowed people to leave much later got very small uh, quotas. That very briefly is the quota system. But it initially the quota system was not the problem for Germans wanting to leave Germany. The problem was that in 1930, uh, President Hoover uh, had decided to uh, cut back immigration and he asked the State Department experts, how can we do this right away without going to Congress? And they found a provision called likely to become a public charge. By the way, the Trump administration uh, used this provision uh, very recently. And so people who were uh, judged to be uh, unable to support themselves uh, would be rejected for visas. Uh, in 1930 or in the depression generally, anyone who had to work was judged to be likely to become a public charge. So the only people who got in uh, were people who were independently wealthy or people who had relatives that were wealthy enough, close relatives who were wealthy enough to support them. And so the initial goal, and this is before Hitler and before Roosevelt, the initial goal was to cut back the German quota uh, to roughly 10%. So roughly 2,500 Germans coming in in a, in a year. And that goal was met, I think, in the 1932 to 33 uh, period. So um, the initial debate within the Roosevelt administration was, should we and can we use more of the 25,957 that are theoretically available under law? And that led to a behind the scenes battle, uh, occasionally publicized, but mostly behind the scenes. And over time, the level of immigration from Germany increased, but not drastically until Roosevelt was reelected in a landslide in 1936. And at the time he probably thought that was his last term. And the, the immigration from Germany was allowed to rise very substantially quickly thereafter uh, to the point where the entire quota was filled by the middle of 1938. And that was the point when Geist was, uh, had maximum influence and uh, he tried to make sure that it stayed filled and that um, uh, he, he tried to figure out ways in which people could get out of the country and wait elsewhere for their turn for visas. Does that do what you need? Becky? I, I mean, that was perfect for me. Okay. Uh, I don't have anything to add. Um, they were racist eugenic laws uh, and the quotas were meant to bring white Protestants to the US. It probably would have been very different had Congress in the 1920s foreseen that the majority of immigrants in the 1930s from Germany were, were Jews. They might it have calculated true. it differently. Yeah, it is true that uh, the estimates I saw of uh, immigration from Germany 
are 85, sometimes 90% uh, Jews. Yeah, some of the consulates complain about that a lot. Yeah. So, so you make the argument that, that guys pushes this. I mean, even, even, with, uh, even with the changes in 1937 on the business of likely to become a public charge, guys pushes this. You, know, you mentioned the, um, the moving of uh, quota slots around, which, which was, uh, you know, really quite imaginative and, and, you know, sort of agreeing with the British and the French to get temporary visas, you know, until U.S. quota numbers came up. But, but there's a lot more um, to this, yes? Well, early on, uh, when the State, State Department was still extremely nervous about any sizable immigration, um, Geist was trying to get uh, German Jewish children uh, into the U.S. because he saw that was a, an area of possible compromise. These children weren't going to take jobs away from Americans or nobody was going to be able to claim that they were taking jobs away from Americans. Uh, and then he pushed for what he called administrative simplification, uh, which meant uh, he had a long informal waiting list. And he said, uh, suppose we tell people now that the economy is getting a little better that they need to put up or shut, shut up, uh, they should apply now for visas. And the State Department didn't like that idea at all. Uh, so he tried a number of things, uh, but the options increased over time and his influence increased over time to the point where uh, by 1938, he was basically running the consulate general and uh, he was the most influential person in the, uh, in the embassy. And he gets children out in 1939, mainly by moving around visas again. Yes, and uh, arranging for the right consul to uh, interview the 50 children from Vienna who the Krauss family uh, mm -hmm. was taking out. So, sorry, go ahead. Norman. No, go ahead, Nick. No, no, go no, ahead. I was gonna go in a different way. So if you have more immigration questions. No, please, go, go, go ahead. Okay, um, one of the other things that, that makes Geist so interesting to me and something that I did not know before I read the book is that Geist was bisexual and he was in a same-sex relationship with a German man for about 20 years um, including the almost the entirety of the time that he's in Berlin so this is at a time when homosexuality is criminalized under German law even from before the Nazis so he is has diplomatic immunity or what the whatever that was in 19 the 1930s but the man he's with does not. And, and they're both in incredibly vulnerable positions and he's still meeting with Nazi officials. How, how did that determine, how, how did that influence his role as a diplomat? It's so interesting to me. Um, I, I wish I had more details to be able to um, reveal his thinking. Um, I mean, here and there, we have uh, little bits of information about the relationship and um, his way of dealing with the situation. Um, uh, he was able to hire his lover as a messenger for the consulate and to some degree that gave uh, the man a, uh, both a reason to see Geist a lot and also a degree of protection guys could have interceded uh, if the guy had been uh, arrested. I don't know if he would have been successful, but, um, and it looked to me like uh, when Guy's sister, who was uh, a kind of substitute uh, wife and housekeeper, uh, got very ill, it looked to me like a Guy's lover uh, stayed home and took care of her for a while. Uh, and uh, we don't get more information about the relationship until uh, they, they both uh, come to the United States and they live together in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, about uh, two, two miles from where I am right now. So uh, uh, the house no longer exists. There's a tennis court there now. Um, um, I, you know, he was, he was a gutsy guy. 
Uh, I mean, he really was going to live his life and um, uh, he wasn't going to uh, avoid high Nazi officials because that he saw that as, as part of his job and um, he wasn't going to give up his relationship. Uh, I have to admit that when I first learned from uh, surviving Geist relatives that uh, Geist was bisexual or gay, uh, it threw me for a loop uh, because I didn't know how I was going to get inside his head and uh, understand his behavior. But um, uh, uh, one of Guy's relatives uh, had fortunately uh, preserved a, uh, a good portion of his childhood diary. And once I had read that, uh, I felt I understood him pretty well. I mean, it, you piece together the silences really well in here. I mean, one of the things that I really love about the book is how deeply you are seated in the archival sources. I mean, even to the point of seeing Eric, his lover's name on a postcard in 1932 and saying, okay, well, they must have been together by 1932, even if it's not mentioned any, it's of course not gonna be mentioned in any sort of official documents. And I'm wondering, there, there have got to be all of these aha moments. Those are the best things about being a historian. And do you, do you have any that stand out in particular for you? Oh, there were a number of them. Uh, I think the biggest one in, uh, for, for historians or um, people interested in Nazi Germany, uh, the biggest uh, aha moment was at the... Uh, Hoover Presidential Library when I came across uh, Geist's letter to uh, his uh, nominal boss, uh, Ambassador Wilson. Wilson had been recalled uh, to the United States after Kristallnacht as a, a sign of American protest, and Geist was keeping him up to date on what was going on. And that was the letter in which Geist revealed that his information about the Nazi intention to kill German Jews came from Werner Best, the number of two men in the Gestapo. And I, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, I, I had been working on Geist here and there for um, decades and I had never seen that. Uh, and I had never seen Geist identify a key source that uh, specifically. So um, that was a big aha moment. Um, the moment when I found out that Geist uh, was bisexual or gay was an aha moment. Uh, the, the moment when I read his childhood diary was an aha moment. Uh, the moment when I got uh, photographs from a different source about um, uh, Geist and Eric Mainz, that was an aha moment. Um, so uh, there were uh, a lot of discoveries and of course, of this research. When I decided to the, write the book, I did not know what I was getting into. Um, but I, 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 I something I also wanted to ask about this, though, was that he, he also went to Oberlin, uh, which was a, a sort of a progressive place at the time, yeah. Um, and and he, he also had this acting career. And so, uh, you know, you sort of hint that um, he was very good at playing cards to the vest, you know, and he was very good at sort of um, hiding his intentions and, and, and in a sense maybe hiding himself uh, as well from his various interlocutors, not only the State Department, but also in, in Nazi Germany. It was, it was an entire package. Um, of development with him, would you say? Yeah, it, 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 he, look, he used all of his various experiences, which we, I haven't really, I've avoided a biographical description for those um, interested. Uh, maybe I should uh, point out how unusual his background was. Um, he was from a very poor family, Cleveland, born in Cleveland, uh, in 1885. He was four years older than Adolf Hitler. Uh, 
He, uh, his father was an alcoholic. His mother was a seriously ill diabetic. He had to drop out of high school uh, to support his family. Uh, he worked for a while, then he caught up um, and uh, finished his high school coursework and got into Oberlin. Uh, he went around giving lectures and, or readings from Shakespeare uh, to local audiences in order to earn his way through college. Um, uh, and then once graduating, he um, set out to become an actor that uh, worked for a little while, but he wasn't uh, getting starring roles. He was getting supporting roles in two different Shakespearean troops. Uh, he gave that up. Um, he, uh, after uh, striking up a, fri a friendship with a reasonably wealthy New York family, uh, he decided to go to Harvard and uh, probably got uh, financial support from his, his host. Um, and he got a PhD from Harvard. This is after dropping out of high school. Uh, he uh, thought about um, a State Department career, but ran into some early obstacles. He um, joined the Navy before World War I ended, went to the Paris Peace Conference. Uh, he then joined Herbert Hoover's uh, relief organization in Europe. And only then, uh, when he was somewhat old to enter the foreign service, did he apply uh, to become a diplomat and he was shunted off to the consular branch, which was the lesser branch. Uh, so um, he had an extraordinary range of diverse experiences, all of which he drew upon in his consular and diplomatic career. And uh, I think the fact that he was so well educated and so skilled in presentation and interpersonal uh, relations uh, allowed him to do what he did. And I think he has a different sympathy from being from a poor family, from um, working in relief work. Like you, it's different from the old guard who is running a lot of the State Department at the time. Absolutely. The, yeah, you, you had to be almost without exception uh, uh, from a wealthy and prestigious uh, background if you entered the diplomatic service then, uh, unless you were a political appointee, which uh, he didn't have the connections for. So um, uh, yeah, he, he, had, he had more empathy for people and for pic particularly people on the margins of society. I have one more question, and then maybe we can take some from the audience. And it, it has to do uh, with the famous Hitler speech um, of January 30th, uh, 1939. This is, this is a speech that all historians of Nazi Germany and the Holocaust know, uh, where, uh, you know, it's very long, but, but everyone sort of uh, quotes this one prophecy that Hitler makes, that if the nations of Europe are plunged into war again, the result would not be the Bolshevization of the earth and the victory of Jewry, but the annihilation, he uses the word Vernichtung, you know, extermination of the, of the Jewish race in Europe. And, and, and Geist had an involvement with this speech too, um, which had to be sort of an aha. This was uh, the period after Kristallnacht when Geist thought um, that either the United States or Nazi Germany might break off relations. And he didn't uh, want that to happen. So um, he got uh, not the text, because I doubt there was an advanced text, but the thrust of Hitler's speech in advance. And it was going to be an attack somewhere along uh, the way on Franklin Roosevelt, as well as the United States in very caustic terms. And uh, Geist told his Nazi contacts that this might well result in a break in relations and there should not be an attack on the president of the United States. And so it was removed and Hitler did not um, attack Roosevelt in that particular speech, although he did uh, do so months later in a, 
a following speech, but uh, for the moment, uh, Geist was able to uh, soften uh, one portion of that most infamous speech. Can we go to some audience questions? Because they're, they're, they're piling up here. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna, uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to take them in any uh, particular order because they're, um, there, uh, there are quite a few, but I, uh, this one I think will will appeal to a number of people, and it's really for both of you. Um, I read in the Garden of Beasts. Um, this is from someone about Ambassador Dodd. Uh, what was the relationship um, between Ambassador Dodd and Raymond Geist? This is something um, that you talk about in the book, and that you both certainly thought about. Um, well. You happen to have asked two uh, people who are not exactly fans of <laughs> Ambassador Dodd. Um, so uh, Becky should follow whatever I say. Uh, Geist uh, saw that Dodd uh, was not really capable of doing all of what Geist was doing. Um, and uh, of course, Geist was a subordinate. Um, but um, he tried to uh, help Dodd when he could and to gently suggest things that Dodd should not do when uh, Geist couldn't really uh, take over the uh, situation. But um, uh, Dodd basically avoided uh, dealing with the Jewish question and Geist thought that trying to help German Jews was uh, one of the things that one should do and that he wanted to do. So uh, they didn't really see eye to eye on all that much. Becky? I'm sorry to say that Dodd was a history professor. Um, he, he was not a diplomat. He had done his uh, PhD in Germany years and years ago, decades before. And so he had very, um, fond memories of life in Germany and was constantly surprised by the Nazis who he kept thinking were not going to be that bad. And then he decided they were that bad and he didn't want to deal with them anymore, which is not what you can do as a diplomat. You have to, to some extent, talk to people. And Dodd did not want to do that. He wanted to give speeches about Jeffersonian democracy all around Germany, um, much to the chagrin of the Nazis. So yeah, I, I think Geist was the brains of the operation. Geist and Messersmith, and then once Messersmith goes, Geist is the is the man kind of trying to quietly and diplomatically steer the ship, just as he quietly and diplomatically tried to steer almost everything in the 1930s in the U.S. State Department in Germany. I'm going to put three questions to the two of you because they're all... Um related in a way. Uh, one, was it not unusual for a lower ranking diplomat in the consular service to have close relations uh, with the Nazis? Um, two, uh, besides being able to keep communication lines open with the Germans, did Geist connect with key players in the rescue effort, um, which I know you can speak to. Um, and, and finally, I think this goes with, with the other two. Um, what was the motive uh, for Werner Best um, to speak as, as openly as he did, do you think, um, with Raymond Geist? Uh -huh. Well, the last one uh, calls for speculation. Uh, but um, I'll, I'll do what I can. Uh, did consuls normally have contacts with um, Nazi officials? Of course they did. Um, Geist, however, was particularly effective and uh, at times particularly aggressive in uh, carrying out his functions. And uh, some of the other people uh, uh, didn't want to take the risk. Let's put it that way. Um, did Geist have uh, connections with uh, rescue agencies or officials? Yes, he did. Um, uh, generally speaking, um, 
you know, he dealt a lot with some of the uh, people who were stationed in Berlin, uh, some of the people from the Jewish Telegraphic Agency. He bailed out of trouble again and again. Some of the people who came in from the outside, Dorothy Thompson uh, and others, um, uh, he, he helped out or tried to help out. Uh, and uh, some of the emigration people, uh, uh, he was looking to solve problems dealing with emigration. You know, um, one of the things that I probably haven't written about enough here, but would like to um, develop further is that uh, many of the scholars of Nazi Germany say, oh, Nazi Germany had an emigration policy during the 1930s. Well, they did in the sense that uh, nobody was ready for a program to kill all German Jews, uh, but um, the Nazis wanted to rob Jews as well as get rid of them. And very often the desire to punish Jews got in the way of emigration. So Geist found that even when he wanted Jews to emigrate and Nazi Germany supposedly said it wanted to, to get rid of uh, German Jews that um, uh, the Nazis were making it difficult. And uh, I like to think that, that there was a battle going on for years over uh, would the desire to punish outweigh the desire to let Jews emigrate. Uh, now, Werner Best, uh, I think Geist had enough of a relationship with him that uh, Best was willing to say some things to Geist that wouldn't, uh, he was convinced wouldn't go get back to hurt, to hurt Best. Uh, and he was also smart enough to recognize that the United States was a major factor in the world. And uh, maybe this wasn't, uh, this wasn't a way, to, killing German Jews wasn't a way to uh, ingratiate Germany with the United States. And so to some extent, his uh, thinking might have been that um, let's let some Jews emigrate. And if I get credit for it later, uh, if the war is lost, uh, it won't be such a bad thing. But that's speculation. We don't really ha have any uh, uh, direct evidence about why Best did what he did. Uh, I should say that there's a very good biography of Werner Best by a German scholar named Ulrich Herbert and uh, uh, Raymond Geist is not in there. Um, he, uh, Herbert did not know about Geist's relationship with best. It's also not translated, right? It's only in German. Yeah. I think it's only in German. The only, uh, the only thing that I would add to the question of um, a lower ranking diplomat and, and their access to the Nazis is that I think people have a sense of the State Department now where, where consular officers and foreign service officers move around a lot to some extent to keep them from having relationships, close relationships with people in the countries that they're serving in. And that was not true in the 1930s. So Geist is there for almost a decade. There were people who were in various cities for much longer for the State Department. And so they could cultivate, they could marry, um, have have relations, personal relationships and, and um, business relationships with people in the countries that they're serving that, that last much longer than an ambassador's did. And but, so, um, but Geist's timing was exquisite. He yeah. was there <laughs> to witness most of the rise of the Nazi movement and Hitler's establishment of a totalitarian state and uh, all the way uh, into the outbreak of World War II. I know. I wish he had stayed for longer. I wish his health had allowed him to stay for longer because I want to know what he would have said in 1940. Or 41. Or 41. Yeah. Um, and then, um, sorry, I saw in the question too that someone asked about, um, in terms of the rescue, specifically called out Cecilia Rozovsky. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, she is the American side of the German Jewish Children's Aid, which Geist is helping in Germany. And so he would have known of her, even if they, he had direct contact they ever met. with her. Yeah. I've forgotten where the, 
the particular sources are, but uh, I know I've seen that he met with her and she met with him. Um, I'm going to go to a couple of others. Um, these, these two uh, sort of go together. One is the question as, as to whether or not um, he ever met Eichmann. He, he was in Vienna. Um, uh, the other is, do you, do you think Geist learned from Himmler or anybody else uh, the extent of the, the extent of the final solution? And I, I think we can cast that as, um, you know, what did extermination mean? I mean, he took the he took the language seriously, which um, you know a lot of historians make the argument that, that the word Vernichtung in the 1930s should be taken more metaphorically than anything else. But, but what would that have meant um, to Geist in, in say, 1938? Um, on Eichmann, uh, I don't have any source that uh, connects Geist and uh, Eichmann. Uh, Eichmann was uh, based in Berlin for a while and then, uh, uh, but he was not terribly prominent in Berlin. Uh, and then went to Vienna, uh, became more prominent there. Geist did go to Vienna, but it was a very brief trip. And uh, that was the trip in which he uh, was able to raise the matter of Sigmund Freud getting out to Britain and uh, got him an exit visa. Uh, but Geist dealt with another Nazi a Gestapo official named Hasselbacher that he knew from Berlin. So I don't have any evidence about Eichmann. Uh, Himmler, uh, well, Geist met with him at least twice in person, uh, and none of those meetings are in any biography of Himmler. Uh, uh, so Geist was able to get some measure of the man in 1934 and again in late 1938, but um, they would not have spoken about um, the final solution, which wasn't yet uh, formalized in any case in 1938. And, uh, uh, but Geist did recognize after Kristallnacht that the preferred uh, solution for German Jews was to kill them. And I think had he been there in 1940 or 1941, he would have recognized both uh, which way things were heading and also the, the mentality of the key people high in the SS and police. And so uh, he could have predicted it um, had he been there. Uh, we don't know whether he um, confirmed reports in Washington that came into the State Department when he was a State Department official because he wasn't tasked with uh, German or European affairs. So, uh, and he had the misfortune of working for a while under Breckenridge Long. Uh, uh, so he had to tread cautiously. Well, you raised it, um, and we didn't get to it. Um, can, can you say something uh, about the case of Freud? Um, and, and can you say something about the case of Einstein, too, which is long before Freud? But these, these are the two most recognizable names. Um, Einstein was a, an unusual case and doesn't fit into the general story of immigration very well, but it's, it's such a, uh, a critical event that it's worth uh, telling anyway. Uh, Einstein wanted to come to the US temporarily to uh, hold a fellowship at, at Caltech and he was thinking of um, uh, relocating to Princeton and what became the Institute for Advanced Studies. Um, uh, and this was just before Hitler came to power. Um, Einstein had been to the US before and it was just a formality to get a visa because the German government had always sponsored him. But this time in late 1932, the German government was very conservative and it wasn't going to give him a diplomatic uh, uh, passport. So um, Einstein had to apply for a visa. And this was at a time when uh, a number of patriotic organizations in the United States 
were fulminating about the danger of communists and radicals coming in. And a court decision had recently uh, ruled communist applicants for visas inadmissible. So a high State Department official named Wilbur Carr um, gave the consulate uh, specific instructions to interrogate Einstein about communist connections. And uh, if we stretch, he had some. He had written favorable letters to some communist front organizations that uh, he might not have known that they were communists. He was not a communist by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, Geist had to ask him about it and Einstein regarded the whole thing as an affront. Why should he have to apply for a visa anyway? So uh, uh, he and his wife uh, raised a fuss in the press. Uh, there was a lot of criticism in the US about the consulate general and Geist was the one directly responsible and guys just wanted uh, to go through the motions and give them visas and get them out as quickly as possible. And he finally succeeded. He filled out some forms for them. Uh, they got their visa quickly and uh, they got out. Uh, Freud, Freud needed an exit visa from Vienna and guys knew uh, one of the Berlin Gestapo people who was temporarily in, in Vienna. And so uh, Freud was able to get out with uh, a whole bunch of relatives and associated uh, uh, doctors and so forth and go to London. It wasn't an American visa, but Geist was the one who got him out. So one of the morals of that story is that an Einstein visa is just a visa in 1932, <laughs> in 1933. Yep. Um, uh, another question that came early. Um, you mentioned James G. McDonald. Um, I, I think this is somebody who read the book. Um, and you may want to say who James G. McDonald is, but you mentioned James G. McDonald several times regarding Messersmith and Dodd and others. Did Geist and McDonald have a special synergy as true as two extraordinarily sensitive diplomats? They truly stood out at the time. Um, I would have loved more sources about their interaction, but um, uh, yes, I, I'm a co-editor along with uh, Norm of uh, uh, some of the McDonald diaries. Um, so uh, McDonald was an American who uh, became League of, High, uh, League of Nations High uh, Commissioner for Refugees and then uh, chair of President Roosevelt uh, Advisory Committee for Political Refugees. Uh, McDonald kept diaries uh, part of the time. And Geist does show up in McDonald's uh, early diaries. And uh, we also found a little bit of contact in uh, the, the later period and in a letter. So, uh, Yes, they saw eye to eye about what the Nazis were capable of. And Geist was in Germany all the time. McDonald came in occasionally. Uh, McDonald met with Geist when he did come in uh, and uh, they could trade views. Uh, and uh, presumably they also had some uh, contact later during the war when Geist was in the United States, but I couldn't find any sources on it. McDonald didn't keep a diary then. Um, someone has asked about your books, and, and I will take this opportunity to point out um, that you, we're, we really have here tonight two... <laughs> we, we really have here tonight two of the people who are most important um, in revising what we know and, and what we understand about American policy both before and during the war um, with regard to the Holocaust. I, I will mention Rebecca's book again, Rescue Board, which is about the War Refugee Board um, uh, created in 1944 by Roosevelt, which was always represented 
um, as, as kind of a fig leaf uh, for inaction, um, and, and I don't want to speak for Rebecca, but it, you know, the book shows that this is um, entirely untrue and, and actually, for a change, uses records from the War Refugee Board um, to make that point. Um, uh, Richard's books um, are, are, are doing something very similar, um, not only the book on Geist, but the, the magnificent book on Roosevelt, FDR and the Jews, which he wrote um, with Alan Lichtman, um, gives a very uh, nuanced uh, picture of, of Roosevelt um, and, and the White House uh, with, with regard to the Jews both um, before and during the war. I, I, I think if you're interested in these things, um, then, then these two books uh, are, are absolutely must-reads. Um, and and I would, I would um, say The Berlin Mission um, is a, is a must-read as well. Yeah, if I can, I can add in that I have a Richard Brightman area of my bookshelves. <laughs> um, and I have multiple <laughs> copies because some will wear out on the spine. I mean, it, his, <sighs> his work is incredible. And Berlin Mission, I mean, what you see going through is someone who knows these sources so well. And that is very rare um, for historians. Often people rely on other people's stories and um, Richard doesn't. He goes straight to the documents themselves, and you see that come through in Berlin Mission, and that's why he finds things that nobody's found before. Yeah, both of you are too kind, but um, uh, I do hope people read the Berlin Mission at least. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a good read. Um, I don't think there are any more questions. I am not seeing any new ones here. Um, I, I want to thank uh, our panelists, Rebecca Erbelding and Richard Brightman for what I think was a fascinating discussion. Um, and I wanna thank uh, everyone for coming. Um, please uh, refer to our website. Uh, oh, wait, there's one new message here. Oh, thank you very much, you're welcome. Um, uh, please refer to our website, um, uh, Jewish Studies, the Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Yes. Norm, we got one last question. Oh, okay. Somebody wanted to know if Geist was Jewish, and the oh. answer is no. Okay. He was he was German, but not Jewish. He was Lutheran. He was Lutheran. Um, yeah. Where was I? Yes, the Center for Jew please, please visit um, the website of the Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Florida. That's jst.ufl.edu. jst.ufl.edu. Um, for future events this semester and next semester. Um, all of our uh, events are recorded. Um, whether you want to be or not, you are on our mailing list now. Um, so you will get those recordings. You can opt out if you want to. But thanks so much for coming, everybody. Uh, thanks again to Rebecca Erbelding and Richard Brightman. Uh, I'm Norman Goda. Everybody have a good night.